All right, what's going on, guys? How are you doing? I hope, uh, I think Pretty this good. is like one of the last fireside chats or panels for the day. The last one? Okay, all right. We'll make it really good. So let's do yeah. that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I think we're going to argue about Grok and LPUs. That's what this session's about, right? Like, that's how we're going to get started. Now, he's, he's a strong no. So we've got an argument already. I think that's where we get started. <laughs> I think that would make for a good session, actually, now that I think about it. Have you, have you tried Grok? Not yet. No, not yet. No? Oh. You, you, I mean. Have you? I have. It is ridiculous. Yeah. I, I can't, yeah. If anyone here hasn't tried Grok yet, like, this is insane. It's like, it, it, it doesn't feel like, I, I don't feel we're, we're ready for it yet, but like, that's how fast the inference is. Like, because our eyes can't keep up with how fast the responses are coming back, so. So maybe we don't need to be reading. I don't know. All right, different different conversation. We're going down a rabbit hole now. Um, well, first of all, like I, I've got a few questions compiled, um, but this doesn't have to be one-sided. If you have questions for these fine folks, please fire away. Uh, I just want to give a huge head nod first and foremost to Sri sitting right there because he helped me with some of these questions today. I actually wanted him to come and moderate, uh, but uh, he was uh, kind enough to hand it off to me. But thank you so much for helping me with this because. Uh, I was being lazy today, and I didn't get, get around to it. Um, but can we do maybe a quick round of intros? I know folks know who you are, but maybe just share a little bit about your backgrounds and you know, brief life history on how you got here, how Jensen got started, and then so on and so forth. But you want to start, Ben? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Ben, the co-founder of Jensen. Um, very brief background. Uh, I started out in the machine learning space uh, doing research. So I did a PhD in deep learning uh, focused on evolving the structure of neural networks, which, very long story short, is an incredibly computationally expensive task because you're training and retraining over and over again all of these con uh, candidate neural networks to get the best kind of meta network. Um, and what I realized doing that is the compute shortage, essentially, that we currently have. Like, AI needs compute, and compute is hard to get for lots and lots of reasons that I'm sure we could kind of go very deep into. Um, but I realized this back in 2015. Uh, took a brief detour into founding a, a different startup in the data privacy space. Um, so I also have lots of opinions on GDPR, but that's probably a bit too boring for this discussion. Um, and then moved into founding Jensen about four years ago. Uh, and Jensen is a decentralized machine learning compute protocol. So we connect up every machine learning capable compute device in the world and then provide all of those devices as a resource to people who need to train machine learning models. Um, and the idea is that it's purely programmatic. There's no people involved. Uh, you're not kind of like booking time on a virtual machine or something like that. You're literally just sending a task which distills value in data into model parameters. You send that out somewhere, and it does it somewhere in the world. Maybe it does it on one GPU. Maybe it does it on a 1,000 MacBooks. You don't need to care. You just know that you've paid somebody to do that distillation, essentially. Cool, hello. Uh, my name's Mark. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Aether. Uh, Aether is a decentralized, enterprise-focused GPU cloud uh, compute infrastructure builder uh, in the AI and gaming space. Uh, my background's in, in infrastructure building. I started off in kind of the oil and gas and power space and then transitioned into uh, building cloud infrastructure networks uh, for cloud gaming uh, customers. So kind of got into the, the GPU cloud space from that kind of high performance gaming uh, perspective uh, and uh, moved into to founding Aether uh, a few years later, taking some of the kind of uh, lessons learned and, and scalability challenges that we identified in the, the kind of GPU cloud space and, and kind of overcoming them uh, in a decentralized way. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Pocket Network. Um, thank you for coming, by the way. Really happy to see such a great set of people come here and amazing conversations. Uh, my background uh, is a bit less traditional. Uh, studied history in college, got into Bitcoin in 2013. Worked at golf courses, restaurants. I uh, eventually worked at a credit union, which I think uh, radicalized me uh, for you know, selling loans uh, with credit cards, car loans, this sort of thing. And discovered Bitcoin in 2013. Uh, taught myself to code, was an iOS engineer for about three or four years, and have slowly gone deeper down the stack. Uh, and yeah, we started Pocket in 2017. Uh, mostly because we had seen, I had seen a bunch of threads over the years on the Bitcoin uh, forums and the ETH research forums uh, about this problem of incentivizing full nodes and this being a very important vector for the space. 
And um, yeah, uh, we kind of started the idea in 2017 and launched the protocol in, in 2020. And uh, yeah, the protocol's been, been, been chugging along. Uh, but yeah, thanks for everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, I had some questions, again, thanks to Sri for, for helping me with these, but you and I were just chatting right before this started, and uh, I just I wanted to pick, I think everyone would benefit from hearing this because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you, know, you were saying something along the lines of like, it was such a different atmosphere last year, like you were one of the only, well, you know, you were one of the first few to look into the space and decentralize compute the way you've been doing it. That was at ETH Denver last year, and now it's a different world. So, can you give us some color, like some sprinkling, you know, like what, what, I mean, I think your background obviously led you to wanting to do this, but like what have you learned in the last year of building this? And, and obviously so much has happened in the last year. So, you know, I think everyone would benefit hearing from your experience having, you know, you were slightly early, early to the game, building Jensen while seeing all this kind of shit go down over the last year. Yeah, I guess the, the biggest thing is probably not a, a surprise to anyone in this space, but the trends, happen, they burn very brightly and very, very shortly. And if you're building a project that goes through those trends, it becomes very kind of obvious that that's what's happening. But it also becomes very difficult kind of just continuing to build through that. Uh, because lots of opportunities come your way, lots of kind of interest comes your way suddenly, and then suddenly that all disappears again, and everybody thinks the thing that you do is a scam for a while. And it's, it's like a weird emotional journey that like everyone in this space has been through. Um, but it is, it's kind of a, a, a weird thing to see in the flesh. I think one of the biggest things we've seen is um, when we in the past have been kind of like talking about what Jensen does and unlocking compute in the world, we've had lots and lots of questions about how you technically do that. Like there's lots of really difficult problems within that. Uh, the biggest one in our minds is verification. How do you ensure that the work has actually been performed correctly? And I think what's really weird is last ETH Denver, there was a big focus on that. Like ZKML was kind of burgeoning and people were looking at a lot of like ZK techniques and they were saying, hey, verification is super important. This time around, people seem to have forgotten slightly that verification is important and it's a lot more like if we can just make numbers go up, then it's okay, like we can kind of get demand and we can worry about verification later. Um, and I, yeah, I just wonder about that. I think that's possibly not the right thing for us be, to be doing as a space. And I think we're gonna look back and say, actually, there were some mistakes made there and realistically you do have to solve the problem properly in order to actually serve the demand. You can't just kind of do the sort of like very first blush way of doing it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably the biggest learning. But then again, there are approaches where, hey, like if you can serve the demand without doing the really deeply technical stuff, maybe you can do it later. So it's just a different approach to, to Jensen, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's probably the biggest difference uh, between last year and this year. Got it, thank you. Yeah, you know, and just piggybacking off of that for you, Mark, when you think about the demand, right, which is, I think Ben brings up a good point, verification is important for a lot of people, this is gonna matter. I mean, if you're training models, right, like this, at the end of the day, like, you know, the proof is gonna be in the pudding. When you think about, agri not the supply side, but the demand side, like, who, who would you think is gonna be your first sort of demographic of customers that you'd want to attract to use Aether? For Aether, we have, uh, I guess, three, three main compute products, right? One of which is, is kind of the AI training uh, side. Uh, in, in that respect, we've aggregated a large amount of H100 GPUs, so it's really big enterprises looking to buy kind of large compute contracts and, and do work on, on our network in that sense. Um, but with our other kind of products, uh, we have a, a kind of a cloud gaming ecosystem product uh, where we do have a number of big gaming companies already scaling their infrastructure and, and their service on the back of, of Aether. So I think we're definitely looking to bring more of those companies onto our ecosystem. Uh, and we've also launched recently this, this new type of compute that we call uh, virtual compute, uh, which is uh, actually the, the, the infrastructure that underpins this really cool piece of technology called essentially a, a, the most consumer-facing version of it is, is called a cloud phone, right? And it's essentially an application that allows you to, when you open it, uh, access a, you know, the equivalent compute requirements of like a $1,500 smartphone, uh, even when your device might just be like a $50 phone, right? So this is kind of a really cool uh, compute uh, opportunity, I think, that, that aligns well with the way that deep end networks help uh, GPU compute scale into kind of emerging markets and areas where uh, it's traditionally difficult to get access to high-end hardware. Um, so for Aether, I think 
uh, definitely we're, we're pushing more for large enterprise contracts in the back of our kind of H100 infrastructure, but we're also really looking to, to kind of build and scale our gaming and virtual compute uh, infrastructure stack as well. Cool, thank you. Uh, I have a, do, you, do you have a comment? Please, fire away. Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we're thinking about demand a little bit differently. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, uh, Pocket can support any open source database, uh, you know, models, open source models included, which is why I'm on this panel. Um, uh, we're focused purely on the inference side, so we're kind of in a unique position where uh, our network can actually aggregate a lot of the supply, uh, whether the H100s, you know, future H200s, whatever it is, and we're able to segment via kind of like tokens per second. Uh, and hopefully provide the fastest, we were talking about Grok earlier, uh, the fastest, most reliable inferencing API that, uh, that, that, that we can, right? So for us, we're really focused on selling to uh, startups and other folks that are really building uh, really AI-enabled apps. And I think, for example, some of the innovations that are happening with, uh, on, the, on the hardware side, I think just an entire new category <laughs> Of, of applications uh, are going to be uh, enabled in these next couple of years. So, awesome. Yeah, you know, if we can stay on that for a little bit, I'm. You know, you you were early to decentralization with Pocket, and it's becoming a theme now. As Ben pointed out correctly, like you know, this was it, it, maybe it's the theme. It's like you know, ETH Denver is like AI Denver. Um, but uh, you know, how do you think about decentralization when it comes to AI? I'm curious, like, maybe we can just go around the panel and talk about that a little bit. I think that was the theme of this panel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, has anyone seen the whole Gemini thing on, on Twitter? Uh, I've only had a couple things in the last like six years really concern me. Uh, one was the whole Elon you know, payment uh, from what is board thing, because our courts have actually been very good as a US, from a US perspective. But also uh, seeing the real bias come out in these in these models, um, and I think it just makes the need for open source models to be so incredibly. It's just the need for that is just like I mean, you probably already knew this, but uh, this was just a, such a clear example of how important it is for us to really push towards open source models, especially, um, and to be able to aggregate this demand on the pocket network side and. Uh, hopefully integrate with protocols like Jensen in the future. Uh, for me, it's kind of like a fight. <laughs> it's actually a very existential fight, is what it feels like. And uh, I think we're all kind of building these, in these institutions that will uh, allow us to hopefully overcome some of these challenges. But it's honestly incredibly concerning. I think uh, when you take a look at um, the, the AI landscape as a whole at the moment, I think it, it's 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 playing out kind of as I think many of us would have expected, right? This alignment between large models and obviously people that have a large amount of, of GPU compute. I think it's kind of a natural progression uh, of how things would, would traditionally operate based on kind of the, the kind of high upside that you see for uh, successful AI models and also the high cost of, of obviously training those models. I think decentralization plays this interesting uh, role in the, in the market, particularly from a deep end perspective, in that hopefully it allows us to kind of democratize access to compute in a way that makes it more likely for these open source AI models to, to start competing. Uh, maybe not necessarily at this kind of broader, larger language model, kind of generalized AI space, but maybe in more kind of domain specific uh, AI models uh, at, at least. So I do think that decentralization uh, within the AI space is really critical, uh, particularly as we move towards kind of a, a maybe a slightly more fragmented uh, AI market over the, the next kind of 12, 18 months. Yeah, I think, I think I'd just riff on that to say, yeah, I think what decentralization does is just create a more competitive AI market where currently the market is able to be monopolized by mechanisms that aren't necessarily the mechanisms that you would want somebody to have an edge in the market for. So like, should somebody have an edge just because they can get the capital and they can get the relationship with, with NVIDIA to get to hoard all of the GPUs and then be able to make something like Gemini? Like, do we all think that's actually markets working correctly or do we think that's like the market's being slightly broken? I think most of us think that that's not the right way for this to go. Um, and I think the, what we need to do then is look at the primitives within this kind of ecosystem and say, can we unlock all of those primitives? Like you said, can we democratize AI? Can we make sure that the primitives are available to as many people as possible so that we can have true competitive markets at the higher level rather than them just being captured 
really far down and then able to do whatever they want further up. I think one of the really good things about the Gemini thing is that it's happened so quickly because it's so clear to everyone that that's not how things should be. <laughs> like, I think everyone uses, like, sees that model and sees those examples and says, is this really what, like, we expected when we thought we were going to do really cool AI? That, like, a small group of people would just, like, tell us this is AI and, like, this is all you can get and you can't have anything else? It's, it's not what anyone really wants. So I think it, at least it's opened the kind of eyes of, like, I think the, the kind of decentralized world and the crypto world have known this for a long time, but at least the AI world, like, I don't think they really realize. And then Gemini sort of shows them that actually the way you're currently doing things, it doesn't have to be that way. It can be a much more open way uh, as long as you unlock these primitives. And there's still a long way to go. Um, we see this a lot when we're trying to recruit the people building models like Gemini to say, hey, come and build like the tools to let everybody else build these models. And they sort of have to go through an ideological shift, but it is happening and it, like, it's, it's pretty exciting. And I think about like uh, kind of deep in more broadly in the promise of networks like ours, it's really cheaper, better, faster. Um, and hopefully at the end of the day, like we can actually provide these kinds of services uh, uh, such that anyone can really access them uh, uh, very easily. So I just generally think, um, and also just, you know, it's a centralized AI and blockchains. Um, you know, I think about autonomous servers uh, you know, when you have agents, uh, you know, a big problem is like someone always has to run a server uh, at the end of the day. Someone has to run those keys. But I think in the future, you might actually be able to have truly autonomous servers and actually enable use cases that were previously impossible, uh, uh, which is really exciting for me. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you mentioned uh, sort of domain specific models. Uh, how do you see that playing out in a decentralized world? I mean, maybe maybe there's like a there's a two by two in here somewhere, like decentralized, centralized, and you know, private data, public data, something like that. But um, does, does you know, from what you've seen and tested the markets, does it feel like we can use these? Like, is there appetite for specific domains to use decentralized networks? Um, and if so, like, what have you what have you learned there? I think in in general, there there should be appetite. Uh, but I think that the deep end networks in, in, in general kind of struggle to meet a lot of the, the kind of criteria that, uh, that corporations have when they look to kind of make long term kind of large uh, contract purchases for, for compute in particular. So I do think that, that the deep end compute solutions are very much uh, the future, right? And I do think that uh, obviously Jensen and, and, and Aether are kind of betting on this, right? But um, I do think at the moment, uh, in particular, the, the industry is, is suffering a little bit from, I guess, the hangover of, of kind of Web3 and, and crypto and, and the volatility of that market, coupled with the fact that traditionally deep end sectors have, have done a really good job of kind of aggregating a, a large amount of kind of very diverse compute, right? Uh, flavors of kind of enterprise, but largely flavored by consumer compute. And, and this is a kind of a very difficult type of compute to package and then sell to enterprises, right? It's difficult to meet the, the service and the quality and the uptime requirements of these big buyers. So I think uh, what we're seeing now is, is this kind of maturity of, of the deep end sector, particularly from a compute perspective, that will hopefully allow us to kind of narrow our focus uh, and, and kind of align more, uh, not just from kind of a, a price and maybe contract flex flexibility perspective, but also from like a, a true kind of stability uh, and, and trust perspective as well, such that you can now go to these big customers and say, hey, I've got this decentralized hardware network, and I can kind of guarantee you that my nodes aren't just going to disappear in the next bear cycle, right? Or that my network's going to crash because, you know, the Super Bowl's on and everyone's kind of watching stuff on their, on their computer or something, you know? Uh, so yeah, I think Deepin's gone through a bit of a, an evolution, uh, and it, it is definitely, I think, uh, getting to a point where these big kind of compute contracts are, are going to be deployed on, on the back of our infrastructure. Thanks. Uh, ben, do you think um, when you pitch this to, I, I'm, and I'm thinking because I think it's, well, my projection here as an investor, I hope it's steady state that there's no difference between a centralized network and a decentralized network. We're able to provide compute resources and they work efficiently and that's our wedge into moving past you know, crypto selling to crypto, right? Like we hopefully we get quote unquote mainstream adoption. Um, and, and again, this is maybe a little bit of a leading question, but is, is, that, uh, is that a good goal to have? Like do we, do, you know, do you, do you envision things the same way at Jensen where like at the end of the day, you don't 
you know, could be any AI developer fine tuning or you know, building a model. It may be for something that's very crypto specific, crypto specific LLM hat maybe or, or not. Like how, how do you think about approaching, I guess everyone outside of the crypto world and is that, is that like a focus for you? Yeah, that, that's definitely a focus. I think we, the way that we view it is there's a big problem out there in the world. It's, it's like mostly a Web 2 problem. It also exists in Web 3, but ultimately we have a solution that solves that problem and we need to kind of push that solution out. And I think y you can, the, the crypto space I think has been very insular for a lot of the problems it solves. Uh, and that's kind of held it back that's because right. you find maybe you have demand that is outside of the crypto, but if you only focus on the crypto use cases, you can find it quite hard to bridge back out to the, the Web2 use cases as well. We generally just kind of view them as the same, like they're machine learning use cases. If mm -hmm. someone's doing machine learning in Web3, it's just machine learning. Like we don't, we don't care that much that it's in Web3. Like I think what's, what is interesting is sometimes those people are more ready to adopt a network like ours, but the reasons that they'll adopt it aren't necessarily the reasons that we want people to adopt it. Like they are ideological reasons, which mm -hmm. it's easy to get ideological users, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily give you the signals that you actually need for the, the vast majority of users. So you have to be very careful, but kind of, I think a, a pragmatic approach is to have users from both sides, essentially. Um, but yeah, the, the way we view Jensen, it's uh, similar to, to Mike was saying earlier around like, are people going to be training models in the future or are models going to be training models? And I think when you think about that, you think, well, crypto has to be there. We have to have crypto payment rails for that to happen. Um, so you can't just kind of build and assume that the models will exist in the Web2 world because they just won't. Like they're, right. they're going to need instant payments. They're going to need the verification built in. They're going to need everything to be completely programmatic. And that's probably the most exciting thing for us in the very long term because it unlocks an entire kind of new ecosystem of, of models and kind of models building models and models potentially then becoming like human in certain ways that I think will be very uncomfortable for <laughs> the rest of us. But yeah, it's a, it's a long-term thing. Yeah. Yeah, I would add, um, we're really excited because Pocket up until very soon has been very insular for the blockchain space, right? We can only sell RPC to blockchain developers. So unless you're building apps on the blockchain, like we can't really sell you. But for the first time now, we can actually sell to Web2 companies. And then they, have to, they don't have to know or care that we have Pocket settling this traffic on the back end, right? As long as we meet our SLAs, as long as uh, their quality of service is, is up to their standards, uh, I'm incredibly excited to be able to sell uh, outside of just, uh, just the Web3 space. And I think at the end of the day, you'll have varying different levels. You know, we're very focused on enabling other gateways. So you have certain types of enterprise gateways, other kind of startup gateways, and everything in between and people offering different types of services, value add services and these sorts of things at the end of the day that will you know, attract, you know, whether it's a Fortune 500, there might be on-prem regulatory you know, uh, uh, restrictions or you know, free for all, you know, I can use whatever it is that I want. So at the end of the day, I don't think you should care. They, yeah. The end customer shouldn't care whether you know, it's a decentralized network or not. It's whether we're really providing right. the, the value at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, well, I'm glad to hear we're aligned on that. Mark, did you have a comment? Or are you good? Okay. Uh, we have a few, mo like, few more minutes. It looks like there's a question. Yeah, excellent. Please, should I bring you a mic? You just want to yell? Let's do that. Uh, I'll just yell. All right. Do you just want to drop this mic right now? We'll just, we'll just call it. <laughs> That's an awesome question. Uh, do you want to repeat the question, or do you mind? Oh yeah. Everyone else uh, here. So we're at a crypto conference uh, talking about AI. What's it going to take uh, for the AI conferences to be talking about crypto? Um, I think it goes to the machine, the machine, machine payments. Uh, personally, like that should enable. They're going to be like, what the fuck? Like, these machines can pay each other cheaply, quickly, easily, uh, and get some really creative people building some some interesting stuff. Yeah, I think the, the payment rails and, 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 and that side of things are, are critical. Once we start nailing that, I think uh, the conversation will definitely start to be had uh, in those circles. I think also just purely from a, a compute aggregation perspective, eventually deep end networks will get uh, big enough and powerful enough that they will start to, to really appear on the radar of, of these AI companies that do have significant appetite. So I think uh, you're also gonna see us start to appear uh, as, as these networks scale. Yeah, I, th I think that 
for the industrial conferences for sure. Like as soon as it becomes like a, a credible source of, of compute that is cheaper and is higher scale and has greater access, like it'll it'd be a no-brainer for it to be talked about at those industrial conferences. I think the the academic conferences, I think it'll possibly come from that that kind of agent based um, based system. So where people are doing reinforcement learning, they're training agents to exist in certain environments. I think the crypto environment is a particularly interesting one because it basically gives you access to the kind of whole entire human environment. It gives agents a way to act in the world via human incentives, which it, again, I think very confronting for most of humanity because suddenly you've got this kind of spike out into the real world where like somebody could build a model which can then actually affect the behavior of people via um, payments in some way. Uh, and I think the, the agent-based modeling world is gonna find that absolutely fascinating. Like we, they've gone through the kind of process of like, let's make a really small environment and let's like, like help an agent navigate through it to let's use like games as an environment that already exists as long as we can like model it um, and then kind of expand that out and you've got like localized um, uh, agents moving through the real world where you've got like a kind of little device that'll do uh, slam and, and and things like that. I think that that research community will get very very excited once those agents can exist in a kind of on-chain ecosystem with actual real-world value, not just simulations. Essentially. Great question. Great responses. I, I know this wasn't directed at me per se, mostly for the experts, but I'll throw in my two cents, my two satoshis. Regardless, um, I think it's talent. Uh, we, you know, I was talking to Sandeep from Polygon the other day, and he said something like, there's only like, you know, 5,000 MFers <laughs> who know how to build shit in crypto. And, you know, maybe similar in AI. And I feel like we just, uh, we need to embrace the dearth of talent. Like, there is actually a dearth of quality talent in crypto. And when we can sort of upscale that and up-level that, and we're able to showcase that the primitives that we have, that we've built, the crypto blockchain primitives that we've built can actually solve a lot of problems that we're seeing appear in centralized AI. I think we're gonna start to see this flip a little bit. But I think we're moving really fast in centralized AI. We're just, not, we don't move that fast with decentralized anything. So um, I think talent is huge. Talking the talk, I think is gonna be huge as well. Um, and the last thing, I, I've, I've been sitting just chatting with a bunch of founders all day today and invariably it's all come down to one thing. And I know Ben spent a bunch of time in the Valley and I know you're based in the Valley, for example, like they're head of product from Jensen, but I think this is gonna matter. So like, please come spend time in the Valley. Like, I, I mean, I'm, maybe it's like a, a long con pitch for all of you to move to San Francisco at some point, but uh, I think it matters. There's a lot of AI energy there. So I think you'll see things differently. Just infuse yourselves into the conversations happening there. It's really different and weird. Um, I think we're, we're coming up on time. Is there, does anyone else have a question? And if not, I have maybe one more I can ask the panel as we try to wrap it up, uh, which is, uh, we talked about like how things were last year and you said the change you're seeing this year. Uh, curious, like what do you think we're gonna see, uh, you know, ETH, ETH Denver, uh, hopefully it's ETH Tampa, I don't know, something like that, you know, maybe it's not ETH Denver, but like, ETH Denver 2025, you know, wh what do you think, where do you think we are at steady state and what's gonna happen then? If you, if you need a moment to think about it, maybe other panelists have some thoughts, but. I mean, yeah, I have no idea. I, I wouldn't even want to predict, like this space is crazy, man. Like, <laughs> That's fine, that's fair. I like how you pass it on. You're like, you first, please. <laughs> Look, I think I think the thing is, is that these net, net network, these deep end networks just need to mature. Uh, like, you know, we grew from a scale of 10 million requests a day to over a billion within 10 months, and that mm -hmm. broke a lot of shit. I think we're going to go through multiple versions of these cycles before we hit to the kind of the main, kind of let's call it mainstream zeitgeist. So, um, you know, I don't know what the I don't know what the flavor of the day will be uh, uh, a year from now. Um, maybe someone will build some generative World of Warcraft or something and you can run around in the world and everyone's freaking out about GameFi again. I don't, that, that's, that's my guess, GameFi. Uh, AI enabled GameFi, there we go. All right, any thoughts? We could just have a massive conference about like AI girlfriends. That could be, could be where we are a year from now. Uh, other than that, I, I don't have any really scientific predictions. Fair enough, all right. Any last questions for the, from the audience, for these wonderful people? All right, if what, not. What's your prediction? Oh, man. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, you know, I was supposed to be asking the questions. Um, uh, yeah, you know, there was a, I went for a long walk with someone the other day, and uh, this is just before we chatted yesterday at our panel, and uh, I think the question was like, what, what do you, like, 
you know, gun to your head, what do you think the chances are that this crypto AI narrative plays out? Like, where do you, you know, is this going to materialize? And I said the same thing you said, which is like, I think, I hope we get everyone to adopt our systems, whether they're in native crypto native or not. And I gave that, in all honesty, I gave it a 51% chance that it works, a 49% chance that it doesn't. But I'd love for us to try and give it a shot because I think just like you started here in this world pretty early in the world of crypto, we're all here, you know, because we believe in these decentralized systems. And I think this could be a really interesting catalyst for this crypto TAM to go up. And so if it works, it could be pretty monumental for us. And we can really prove that the thesis behind decentralized computing, whether it's for machine learning, whether it's for, uh, you know, running RPC nodes, uh, it, it, it truly works, right? So. I, I give it a chance that with all the work you folks are doing and, and all the hard work that's going in here that actually materializes over the next year. And uh, we, you know, we, 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 we reap the rewards of the, the compounding work that's happening with AI and crypto. Agents become pervasive and we start to trust the systems that we started to build. So uh, I, I don't think there's any net new narrative. I think we just, uh, we realize that there's more work to do because adoption is starting to grow and we need more talent and we need to you know, fight the centralized incumbents. A oh, question? What resources do you use to go about finding the best way to reward users of DPIM projects uh, with tokens uh, through their tokenomics? Like, how do you figure out the tokenomics for your projects? Very good question. Um, our approach is generally that tokenomics is very, very difficult. Um, I think it's very easy to fall into a trap of uh, having some kind of emission schedule to uh, bootstrap a certain side of the protocol, but in doing that, you just end up incentivizing people to do something that isn't the main thing within your protocol. I think that the goal that we have is basically to not have to use token incentives basically at all. Um, the kind of gold standard is you've just got a transaction happening between two or more parties who just want to be in that transaction for financial reasons, and that's it. Um, I think in some very, very niche cases, it's like you might need to bootstrap and, and kind of subsidize in order to bootstrap supply or bootstrap demand or something like that, but it should be a kind of very short-term, very specific requirement. It shouldn't be something that your network relies on. And I think the, the crypto space has struggled with this massively. Like I think so many networks have said, silver bullet, we'll just like bootstrap supply, we'll put $300 million or whatever it is into that. And then that you realize all of that money is gone and there's no demand. And like, what have you achieved realistically? You've just made numbers go up for a while and then you, you haven't actually achieved real demand. So like it's, it's been the kind of same message that everybody knows underneath it all. Like you've got to get real usage. That's what matters. Like real people doing real transactions and using like the compute or the, the RPC or whatever it is, that's all you're trying to achieve. And don't try and kind of game it to get it because by gaming it, you just create a reason for people to do something else in your protocol than actually the, the work that you intend them to do. I, 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 do, I do agree with you. Um, however, when you spoke a little bit about it earlier, uh, about the differences between decentralized networks and, and centralized networks, a lot of what we do is the exact same, right? It's the same hardware, it's the same network, it's the same models, right? So there's not all that much difference between uh, the two kind of uh, the two hemispheres, right? But one thing that is different, that one thing that is different is the the ability to have a, a token, right? So I do think that whilst uh, kind of using a token incorrectly can, can really hamstring your, your network. I think that the token does provide this really interesting and important lever that I think we would be silly not to, to kind of utilize. So I, I do totally agree with you that you need to be incentivizing the correct type of behavior in your network. Uh, and I think that generally aligns with uh, utilizing the token to promote kind of stab stability and, and trust as opposed to utilizing it to kind of kickstart or, or, or pour gasoline on, on certain activities. But uh, yeah, I, I do think the token plays a, a really important role um, in, in differentiating the, the value of, of our networks and, and centralized networks. Uh, yeah, I, actually to take the other side, I actually don't think they need to be, it needs to be that complicated. Um, I think you can understand what the outcome you want. I think you need to understand what like game design papers that have been around since the 90s, what's the source of the token, what's creating it, and what are the sinks? And as long as you build, like what Ben said, a real product that people actually use, and the economy like is in equilibrium, I think that's really what you're looking for. And, you know, no offense to like block science if anyone's here, 
Like, I think we over-engineer this so much that at the end of the day, it's like, who's using it and why? And is this sustainable? <laughs> is really at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, games have been figuring this out for decades, honestly, and this is no different, in my opinion. Thank you. All right, I think we're out of time, but I know we want to be mindful of our host here who's got maybe one more thing to, uh, to do. But uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts. Can you please give them a round of applause for their time?